Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, he has changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend can do. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong arms around me. And he led me in the way that I should go. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. Think about these words. Think about them. That's what we're here for, to think about Jesus. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could ever take the sin and sorrow from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. Oh, how much he cares for you and me. Can you say amen to that? I love that song. And that's what I'm here for this morning. I'd like to uh, thank Brother John and Jay and uh, Jessica and all of you for being here. And uh, I'll ask Brother John, I said, how much time have I got? And, and uh, he acted a little confused, so the only thing I know to do is I'll try to quit preaching before you get through listening. Is that a deal? Good. Well, it's Easter Sunday, time when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Did you know Easter is the only holiday in the Bible mentioned directly by name? Christmas not in there. Uh, Mother's Day is not even in there. Only Easter. I thought it's a, a, a kind of a thing, but Anyway, Easter is very special. Do you realize that Easter is where somebody come up with the idea for zombies? Yeah. And the walking dead? That's where the idea came from. Did you know that on Easter Sunday, Jesus is not the only one that rose from the dead? You didn't know that? Read Matthew 27, verse 53. 54, I believe it is. 52 and 53. Read it. Um, I'm going to confess to you, I'd like to preach you a great Easter message, but will you let me be led by the Spirit? Jesus taught the people that he had to leave 
but made this solemn promise in John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And in John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I like that promise. And I believe the Lord gave me this message. I prayed and asked him. It's been a while ago since uh, this message came to me. And I prayed and I asked the Lord in the middle of the night. I said, okay, where does it go? Since I don't preach regular anywhere, where you got this for? And it's just like a sparkling glass of water. Just as clear as crystal, Gallatin. So I've been waiting, and I hope you've been waiting. <coughs> and we're going to do our best to deliver what the Lord put on my mind. <coughs> Most of you that know me at all know that I like to raise questions in your mind. Not to try to destroy your faith in God, but to cause you, as Brother Jay's already done, he's back there flipping scriptures looking for what I said about the other people that rose on Easter Day. Had you find it yet? Was there any more people that rose besides Jesus? I tell you, the resurrection power of God's more mighty than we ever think about. And so there were other people that did come out of the graves. And I like to raise questions to make you search the scriptures for every little tidbit of truth because every little tidbit of truth you get will make you a stronger Christian, a stronger believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can't always go by what a preacher says because we are men and subject to error just like anybody else would be. But you can depend on God and over the years many of us have come to believe things that are just not exactly what the Bible says they are. So today, this morning, rather than just an Easter sermon, I'd like for us to look at the parable of the ten virgins. Not virgins, virgins. But before we do, I want, I want to count. I want to know exactly how many people are here. We'll start with John back there as two. Somebody count everybody for me, including me. Is it 14? How many? Yeah, 14? Great. I just wanted to know an exact count. And uh, I want to mention this too, that you need to pray for your pastor, Daniel. I've talked to Daniel a couple of times this week, and I love to get in with somebody and talk about the scriptures and about the things of God and and Connie said we sound like two old women trying to bake a cake over the telephone. But that's all right. I enjoy talking to somebody about the scriptures and about the Lord and what he's doing. And um, so anyway, wanted to get that out. Are you there? Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. I'll be reading from the King James Version it's the oldest one that I know how to read and seems to me to be as accurate as anything that they come up with today, maybe more so. Matthew 25, verse 1. We'll read the first 13 verses. And then I'll go over some of them because there's some things we need to see out of here that anyway I missed for quite a number of years. And we need to pick up on these. Matthew 
chapter 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore. For ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now I want to go back over these things and let's see what the Lord is saying. These are, in my Bible, red letters, meaning the words that Jesus spoke. And first of all, uh, he says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. We're not talking about the kingdom of God now. Remember that. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. It just dawned on me early this morning. I asked my wife, Connie. I'm glad she's always with me and supports me. And I asked her, I said, Is there a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? The Bible says there is. As a matter of fact, I looked up a scripture that says... Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. But it never says the kingdom of heaven is within you. So there has got to be a difference. You see, there's a lot of little things in here that we go over. If God had written all the things that's pertinent, the world would be full of books and there wouldn't be any room for the rest of us. So we have to dig out through prayer and faith and the leadership of the Holy Spirit the little truths that are hidden in here. The first thing about this parable is that we need to know what the Lord is representing by the people and the things that are in this parable. This parable is prophecy, meaning foretelling something off into the future. And it is a blessing and a warning. All that wrapped up in 13 verses. Let me explain this. If God's people wanted to start a synagogue, I'm talking about in the day of Jesus now, 2,000 some odd years ago, if they wanted to start a synagogue, which was their form of a church, if they wanted to start a church, they had to have at least 10 people. They, the leaders of the towns, the mayors, the Sanhedrin, and religious rulers of that day would not allow a little country place down the road here 
to start a synagogue unless they had at least 10 people. Now, a lot of people have said, well, this is just the fulfillment of the scriptures and all that. No, 10 was ten put in the Bible for a reason. The number in the Bible, when you read a number, it's there for a reason. Otherwise, he would have left it out to shorten it up, and that way more people might read the scriptures. <clears throat> The next thing is, we need to know who are these ten virgins? What do they represent? Well, there's a lot of uh, discussion about that. But in the book of Revelations, chapter 14 and verse 4, Jesus again lets us know, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Hmm. I was raised to think a virgin was a woman. Not according to this. It says they, these are they, which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. So I think it's safe for us to say these ten virgins represent people that, are, that go to church and profess to what we would call Christians, followers of Christ. Well, that kind of settles that. What is represented by the lamps then? In Matthew 5 and verse 14 it says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So the lamps represent somebody that is presenting light to the world. So, wouldn't you agree that that's what the lamps really represent since this is a parable? And then it goes on to say that in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 15, neither do men light a candle but put it on, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we can see that the lamps are representing a church that should be giving out light. And then the next thing, what does the oil represent? Because there's a kind of an issue in this parable about oil. Well, if there is, I don't want to know what it represents. <clears throat> I hadn't been able to find a, a direct scripture that says directly that all represents the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. But there are almost 200 references that imply it does. Like in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9 in the King James Version, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So we see many, many references there. And you've probably heard it preached before. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. When we anoint somebody for healing, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. 
Well, let's move on. What does he mean? The wise went in and the foolish did not. Many sit together in church, but a dividing time will come. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So you can see by the division, by the judgment, that there's coming a time when there'll be a separation between those that are genuine Christians, those that genuinely believe and trust God, those that have sought everything that God has for them, those that have confessed all of their sins, those who have rejected any sinful way, those that have been faithful to worship God on the day is appointed, those that really believe that not only did Jesus die on the cross, but believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, that he did come out of the tomb, that he is alive, and that he is coming again. I don't see how any human being could deny the fact that God promised in the very beginning that there would be a sacrifice made. You see, the important thing to you and I about Easter and about this season is that you and I were guilty of sin. And God pronounced in the very beginning that if we're guilty of sin, then our judgment on us is death. And you and I the most thankful thing we should have at Easter is that God promised from the very beginning, I will supply a sacrifice for your sins. I will see to it, the price is paid. And on Easter, that price was fulfilled. Jesus was a sacrifice for the things that you and I have done wrong, for the lies that we have told, for the adultery we have committed, for the drugs we have taken illicitly, for the drunkenness that we've committed. He paid the price. He was the sacrifice. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth for your sins and my sins, the things that we were guilty of and deserved to die for because he was perfect, sinless, and therefore that made him the perfect sacrifice for you and us. And how can any person deny that if they look back through history, I don't care where you look, you will find that Jesus Christ and His death upon the cross at Calvary and His resurrection, He has changed the world for at least 6,000 years and maybe more that God didn't choose to tell us about. So some are wise and some are foolish. Some believe and some doubt. I have a question for you. Did the foolish really think they could buy all? Or did they think that the five wise should give them their oil. The question is, can you live off of somebody else's salvation? No. The wise told them, 
Go down to the people that sell and get for yourself. And that's what you and I have to do when it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit and to the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to go get it for yourself. You won't make it in on somebody else's religion, somebody else's salvation. You won't make it in that way. The wise virgins told him, said, go get all for yourself. As I look over these scriptures, it it seems so clear. Verse 3, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Huh. Why wouldn't they take oil if you took lamps? Now lamps are one thing and oil is another. Did you ever think about that? You can't have a lamp. In other words, you can't be a light for Jesus. You can't sing with a little ditty that we used to sing Sunday school about letting your light shine unless you got a lamp. Well, what does the oil do for this situation? Kind of heats things up, some fire. Brings a little fire with the light, doesn't it? So there's two things represented, at least two things. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. The wise and the foolish. And I have to confess to you, there's a lot in the church. There's a lot that are virgins. Virgin meaning their sins had all been cleansed. There's a lot in the church that have gone to sleep. As a matter of fact, the implication from Jesus' mouth is right here that all have slumbered and slept. And it's time for us to wake up. <laughs> I'll throw in something here. One of the deacons in a church was asked by the told by the pastor, uh, Deacon, go over there and wake up old brother John. He's asleep back there. And the deacon just looked at him and said, You put him asleep, you wake him up. Pretty good idea. Well, there are a lot of preachers in the world today that's trying to wake up some people, and it's time for us to wake up. And then it says in the sixth verse, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And there's a lot of preachers in the pulpits today, internet, everywhere you go, if you ask them, They're crying. The bridegroom's coming. It's not going to be long till Jesus returns. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's coming. You need to get ready for him. And in the seventh verse, Then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Get your hearts right with God. Get your lamp trimmed. I don't care if you've been in church all your life or been here for one service. Get your lamps trimmed. Get ready to go. I'm telling you, the Lord told them back then, that's been over 2,000 years ago, to trim their lamps. 
then we're already 2,000 years closer to the time when Jesus returned. And just like he promised to come out of the grave on Easter Sunday, he's going to keep the promise, Brother Jay, to come back and get us. Hallelujah to God! He's coming back. And in the eighth verse, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. I don't want your oil. I want my own oil. <laughs> That's the reason I made a trip down to the altar and said, God, I want all the oil I can get. I'm going to need this oil. If you want me to preach the gospel, I need the oil of the Holy Ghost. And there's a lot of places that need this oil. Don't you know what oil does? I've been working for the last three or four days. See them black fingernails? I've been working repacking the bearings on a travel trailer and got grease everywhere. But you know what that grease does? It keeps the wheels just rolling just as smooth and steady. It keeps them from getting hot and falling off or breaking an axle. You need the oil. When the Holy Ghost is in something, it'll run smooth. Oh, you might have some disagreements, but they're easy to smooth right over and go on and get things done for God instead of insist on doing it my way. Amen. Tuck your toes in if they're hurting. Five of the wise virgins went in to the bridegroom, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The other five decided then it was time for them to get some oil. And they went to them that sell. They took the advice. But when they came back, the door was closed. When they came back, the door was shut. And they begged. Lord, Lord, open to us. And Jesus wasn't being hard-hearted with them. But he said, verily I was saying to you, I know you not. I know you not. How many got to go in? How many was shut out? What is this parable talking about? The kingdom of heaven. Jesus said so in the very first line. Five got to go in. Five were shut out. That's the reason I wanted an exact count. Just exactly like Jesus speaking in this parable. What Jesus is telling us here in this parable. Not me. No, I'm not judging you. I am a pretty good fruit inspector, but I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. And you know already because you heard me read it. Jesus is saying, half the Christian religious people of today, half of them are 
not ready. Is that what he's saying? Five went in and the door was closed to the other five that didn't have the oil. That's half. That's 50%. That's a terrible number. Five went in and five didn't. That's what Jesus' parable is about. Jesus is saying to these people here and his hearing, there's half of you that are not ready to go to heaven. What can you do about it? What did the wise tell them to do? Go and buy for yourself. Go and buy for yourself. That's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to go and buy for yourself. Whether it's salvation, you've got to go yourself. I remember when I was saved, a preacher came to my home. I was under such terrible burden of conviction I'd cry my eyes out. I'd pleaded and begged and tried to do my best. And he whips out a little track and says, Here, pray this little sinner's prayer. I prayed the little sinner's prayer. It didn't help a bit. Didn't get me anywhere. And he said, Well, believe in the Lord. I said, I believe in the Lord. I've always believed in God since as a little child. But still I knew I wasn't saved. He, he tried everything in the book, but when I, when I began to plead and beg God for mercy and to forgive me, when my repentance was accepted by the Lord, then the Holy Spirit came in and bore witness with my spirit that everything was going to be all right. I went for myself and got what I needed to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was ready to go in. And you're going to have to do the same thing. You can't shake hands with the preacher and get there. They can baptize you to your waterlogged as a bullfrog. It ain't going to get you there. You ought to be baptized as soon as you know you're saved. All of these things, and you can work and do all the good you want to do, but all the good that every one of us could do here today would not make up for the sins of one person. Only the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross of Calvary can pay that price. And only His resurrection from the dead can prove that what He said He would do and if you're one of the fives, then you can't sit around here in this church and brag and tell people you're a Christian. You need to get out there and go and tell them and take your lamp and take some oil with you because they won't understand you unless you're anointed. Now I'm wondering, I want you to stop and look around at each other. There's 14 of us. Seven, according to the words of Jesus, probably not ready. While we stand together, we're going to sing a song, Fill My Cup, Lord. I want you to look around at each other. 
Some of you need to say, I wonder if they're ready. Others are looking around and saying, I hope they don't know I'm not ready. It doesn't make any difference what other people think. It's what's right in your heart. Do you need to come to this altar this morning? Bow down there and ask the Lord to fill your cup while we sing. Lead us, Jessica.